What's going on, everybody? Welcome in to the Monday, March 4th edition of the Daily Energy News Beat Stand Up. Here are today's top headlines. First up, Total Energies upholds March restart date for Denmark's largest natural gas field. Next up, solar farms are being sold early and cheap. Here is one solar for sale. 1,100 acres, 15 million in the town of Sharon. Interesting article on kind of some of those solar farm economics. Next up, canceled U.S. offshore wind farms back at a higher price. Who would have saw that coming? Next up, Bank of America reveals where it sees oil prices heading. And then we will end up with a little OPEC chat. Oil markets await the next OPEC announcement stool then toss it over to me i will quickly cover what happened with oil and gas prices on thursday friday we did see a little bit of a rip up above 80 um before settling just a little bit below 79 or us 80 dollars um at 79.97 i'll cover what's going on with rig counts and then finish up with an interesting reuters article um kimridge trying to take over silver bow or at least they're, they're pushing for it so we'll cover a little little of what's going on there and then we'll let you guys get on out of here and get back to work. As always, I am joined by Stuart Turley. I am Michael Tanner. Stu, go ahead and kick us off. All right. Hey, let's get rolling over to uh, Total Energies or Total Energy, as I say in Tex Oak. Upholds March restart date for Denmark's largest natural gas field. Uh, Michael, holy smokes. This is uh, EP Denmark, a subsidiary of the, the big uh, Total Energy. Um, this is a lot of gas that's coming back online. Um, the Tyra has been a center of processing for more than 90% of the natural gas produced in the Danish North Sea. Holy smokes. Wow. There was a crane that went into a uh, a process module listen to this 2.8 billion cubic meters of gas per year unbelievable um that's a lot of uh, and they call it the danish underground consortium which is duck which is not what we consider a duck here in the u.s um and its operator 43.2 percent and then the blue nord is 36.8 and norsfaden at 20 percent it's pretty uh incredible amount of natural gas that's needed for europe it is and it, it it also shows you the imbalance about what's going on here at home with our natural gas markets i mean you've got companies like chesapeake um southwest yep. and they're shedding rigs like crazy we'll see it in the rig counts numbers coming up here yet overseas with the spreads being so high you'll be you'll be able to get um these type of uh of projects evaluated i mean it's great for norway they really need this and specifically what's going on i mean um in the north sea excuse me um this is going to account as you mentioned 80 percent or 90 percent was it 80 or 90 percent of the natural gas that's coming through uh this facility is going to be from the tyra facility isn't that nuts <laughs> That's a big boy. I mean, when you look at the picture uh, of that thing, I wonder how many crew members that thing holds. It's a lot. It's a decent amount. So, no, uh, good for uh, uh, Total going back in there and, uh, and and bringing up that gas field. It's going to be needed. Trust me. It's only going to get worse. Hey, one last comment. We'll go to the next story here. Um, when uh, I think Total and uh, the other European uh, uh, big oil – we're going off the deep end, like beyond petroleum. Uh, now that's they've come full circle. <laughs> yep, exactly. Yep, Let's, they're back on natural. They're drilling for natural gas offshore. Wow, love it. Hey, solar farms are being sold early and cheap. Here's one for sale: one thousand one hundred acres, fifteen million in the town of Sharon. Uh, Michael, this story goes with what is happening and what you've heard me at nauseum talking about. And that is that there's a uh, early death to wind and solar that's not being talked about. Mm -hmm. Now, let's go through some of these numbers. And uh, I, I got a lot of uh, feedback after I put this out on my LinkedIn. The total current income over one year is $1.1 million a year. This is uh, so your cash flow. You could almost sit down and do the cash flow on this. There's also rental property on here. 
but here's where it gets a little dicey. Okay. This does not include when the thing uh, is over and done with the owner would probably get to get this taken care of. So it's got a lease for 25 years, but here's where it really is a problem. Who's got the reclamation costs associated with it? And in most solar farms, it's the landowner. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 going to be interesting to see the life cycle of these projects. I think you're absolutely right. The cleaning these sites up and reclamation. I mean, the mining business went through this 15, 20 years ago or, or yep. more really more like 20 years ago when reclamation really became a thing and you couldn't just deface an entire mountain and move on. Thank goodness we've moved beyond that. But these yes. mining projects have started to bake You've had to bake all of that into your future capital expenditures, and it's widely known in the space that the life cycle of these things will be 50 years. You'll produce for 20, and then the next 30 years is going to be a massive year-over-year reclamation project. It's going to, that's going to eventually fall into, you know, it's going to fall into, it's, it's already coming to the oil and gas space. We've seen that with the orphan wells. We've seen that with some of the, the money that's actually ironically pouring in from the federal government to attempt to clean up some of this stuff. It's one of the, the few smart investments our government has made. They need to make more of those smart investments, but we know they won't. We'll, uh, so we got to take, we got to take the winds where we can. You're going to see this reclamation come to, you know, the wind and solar space here very quickly. It's just, it, it may take five, 10 years for it to actually become a point. Um, absolutely. And how many landowners are already going to get clobbered by this? Hey, let's roll over to the next one. This story is, uh, very wild and huge canceled U S offshore wind farms back at a higher price. Remember when those other, uh, uh, they were all canceled, uh, because they had no bidders. Mm -hmm. uh, recall leading developer Orsted were hit with 5.6 billion in impairments mm -hmm. for walking away from the multiple deals. Now they're signing new ones with prices that are almost double. That's why they walked away. I did not know that until after reading this article. Then they have the, uh, there's a chart in here. And if you take a look, uh, Ms. Producer, if you could pull that in, the LCOE, the Levelized Cost of Energy Comparison. I found this very interesting. And the author brings out a fantastic point. Take a look in that center, Michael, where the wind offshore is absolutely out of line. Mm -hmm. 140 to 200 dollars uh on uh technologies conventional general unbelievable i mean th they are here's where you and i have talked about the wind farms um being fiscally unsound from day one after eight years they have to be redone guess what's happening michael i've been talking to some wind folks Mm -hmm. And some solar folks. And what's happening is in that a in that seven year mark, they start refiling for reworking these wind farms using the Porculus bill, the Inflation Reduction Act. They're double dipping only after eight years. Do you know how despicable that is for the consumers? and the wasted products, and this is not good for the environment. And then uh, the reason that those first two were canceled, Michael, is because they would not approve a rate increase. <laughs> this is a Ponzi scheme. It is a shell game of, okay, I can take my subsidy here, move it into this category, make my accounting look good. I go snag my profit from this um, a new bill that got passed. And as you can see, these the, the, the cost of energy development, specifically for wind offshore, is being massively it reduced is 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 the chart that we just saw, that, that, that LOC or L LCOE chart wrong no it's just not factoring again the full life cycle i thought it's you know really interesting you know you've got nuclear at absolutely atrocious levels 141 to 221 and you know that's stripping out a lot of the other costs unfortunately associated with it so not in my opinion what this shows is that we need to figure out a way to bring nuclear down on this on on, on this chart so that we can actually roll this out at a lot better of a chance but no i mean these 
they, they, these offshore wind projects. It's a nice sleight of hand they're doing, though. Hey, we're going to cancel this project and reinstate this one at a higher price. Well, and then there is uh, this is all about the lobbyists in in Congress and who's paying them. So uh, you wonder why John Kerry flies in private jets. <laughs> All right, let's go to the next one, Michael. Getting into the uh, B of A, the Bank of uh, America, reveals where it has seen the oil price uh, heading. Interesting points on this, and I want your opinion on this. Uh, This is a quote out of here. Uh, Robust U.S. shale supply growth, warm uh, winter weather, more renewables, and fast interest rate hikes have now forced OPEC to pair back oil production for 18 uh, months now to firm up crude prices, even as geopolitical uh, have turned more uh, complex, the analyst stated in the report. Um, What does this mean for oil prices? $100 a barrel? Mm, No. Uh, They're saying in here that it'd be between the 80 and $85 uh, mark. Which I think think is, which is, is conservative. They point out a a few things, you know, OPEC has, has shown that it's going to really set a floor of about $70 a barrel. They'll cut to maintain that. And we're talking Brent oil prices right now, but also one of the reasons they point out why oil prices are kind of capped around that hundred mark is that there's enough spare capacity sitting out there around 5 million barrels and enough non OPEC supply growth to counteract whatever cuts are going on with OPEC. And we'll cover here in the next final article, what, what OPEC might seek to be doing at their next meeting. But I think it's imperative to point out that, you know, we're already almost at $80. This is probably at most where you're going to see oil prices, in my opinion, stay. I would tend to agree with where B of A has their analysis. I don't think they're being too bullish. They're clearly, um, you know, in a sober mindset, thinking about how the markets are going to react. Um, you know, I, what does this mean? I think this has a lot of, you know, this is going to drive a lot of thinking, especially because uh, B of A is 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 somewhat active. Um, is I mean, they're not as active in the oil and gas um, M and A space as as maybe Goldman Sachs is or some of the other smaller, uh, more specialized energy investment banks. But it's clear that their sentiment is somewhat felt around the industry, and in that you know we may be not to say we're at a structural top right now, but we may not see prices push much higher than this. So it's be interesting what that means. I think right. for deals as it goes forward, specifically in the United States. Again, we're talking about Brent prices, so subtract about you know five five dollars yeah. from that. I mean, to think about at it, the, Brent's at eighty four dollars right now, so we ain't, we may even be a little bit above that band. And I, I think it's time. I think let's roll into the next one because really a lot of where prices are going uh, has a lot to do with what OPEC is going to not just do at this meeting, but what they will then signal at this meeting go forward for the rest of twenty twenty four. Uh, You bet. Uh, Oil markets await the next OPEC plus announcement. This is out of uh, oilprice.com. They're they're good folks over there. Um, And when you take a look at these charts, there's a lot. I I love this report that you get out of there. Um, But when you sit back and take a look, let's take a look here. There's the. Yeah, at the time of this, uh, this is about right. Same thing. Seventy nine ninety seven is mm-hmm. one. Well, yeah, uh, that was the close on Friday. Markets don't open here for another yeah. thirty ish minutes. We're recording this about four p.m. here on the third, so you know we we still got a little bit to go. But that was yeah, as of the close there, eight thirty. Um, you know. No, I'm sitting here trying to take a look here. BP doubles down on Egyptian upstream. Mm. Boy, uh, there's another 1.5 billion in gas projects in Egypt over the next three to four years. And when you take a look at what OPEC plus and what uh, the B of A um, are also looking at is the amount of uh 2.3 2.3 million barrels per day in 2023 that would say, oh, that's peak oil. Uh, are you tired of hearing peak oil yet? <laughs> well, we, we've heard peak oil for, for years now. I think what's interesting is this is yet this BP doubling down on a drips and upstream. It's really a gas project. Notice the trend. All of the gas is going overseas. 
that will come back to bite us in the Bahonkis soon. Trust me. It is sad that it's also by this U.S. Uh, administration. Yeah. No, so. it's 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 absolutely unbelievable. We also I love this. They, they kind of roll through a bunch of these top stories. We're also seeing another three million SPE refill. So not, not like buying at the top. Oh. And it's sour crude, too. We can't even get the good stuff. It's oh, like yeah. I wonder uh, if they're buying it. Never mind. Uh, and you take a look at U.S. hit sanction on. Yeah, you knew where I was going with that one. I, See, this is what we call self-censoring. Thank goodness, Stu. Thank goodness. I, I, I just walked right up to that social barrier, and I did not want you to hit me in the back of the head with a shovel, Michael. We didn't That's, need to do a second take. Trust me. Yes. Uh, and then you've got a story that from uh, Reuters, right? Yeah, yeah, we'll do. Uh, let's go ahead and, and and switch over to and cover and finance here. But before we do that, let's let's go ahead and pay the bills here real quick, guys. Um, as always, the news and analysis that you're hearing is brought to you by the world's greatest website, www.energynewsbeat.com, the best place for all of your energy and oil and gas news. Stu and the team do a tremendous job making sure that website stays up to speed. Everything you need to know to be the tip of the spear when it comes to the energy business. Hit that description below. You'll see everything, all the links to the articles, timestamps, and the ability to interact with the show. You can check out dashboard.energynewsbeat.com, the best place for all your data news combo. Got some really, really cool things coming from there we're going to be rolling out a survey here very shortly so we hope you guys go ahead and take that you'll be able to find that in the description below um, we're going to be rolling out what I think is a really cool uh, subscription service. And we really guys want your opinion on what you would like in that things, you know, whether it's more premium news feeds, whether it's it's specialized, more anal more, you know, analytical style content from us, whether it's maybe some of uh, the tech projects that we have working on. We really appreciate everybody's feedback. Go ahead, hit that description below for the survey. And we'll, 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 it would be, it would be awesome to hear you and, and, and filling that out, get you access to our, to be able to kind of beta test and dog food the original product so once we get once we get it up and running you guys will have first and uh, access to be able to get a look take a look give us feedback and and get a little bit of a free trial access so go ahead and fill that out hit the description below um and and, and check that out Let, let's move over to the markets i mean we saw on friday the markets actually um up fairly big nasdaq up 1.5 percentage points s p 500 up Eight tenths of a percentage point, uh, fifty one thirty seven. That's again rolling near all time highs. Um, Bitcoin trading above sixty two thousand right now, so we're almost back to where it was prior to uh, prior to kind of that that crash that happened, the having or quote unquote that's coming. Um, it could, we could see an, an impact to where uh, prices go from there. So everyone's going to be kind of you know. I, Watching, watching that per se. If you're in the crypto space, we did see crude oil rise about 2.1 percentage points uh, from a WTI perspective, closing at eight at 79.97. It'll open here somewhere around that 79.81 mark. So a little bit of softness this weekend, but we saw all the way up to about S80, uh, 80, 90 um, in terms of the top price too, mainly off the back of just some um, um, somewhat aggressive. Um, announcements coming from OPEC. The, the the signal is going to be that they're going to most likely extend these cuts. The OPEC has 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 signaled for, I think, for weeks now. And 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 as they meet here in the coming weeks, they've gone ahead and 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 have basically said, hey, we're going to continue to cut. These cuts are going to stay within for the rest of the year. Um, remember, there's not only the cuts coming from OPEC, but Saudi has the little Saudi sprinkle on top, which is that extra million barrels. So when you talk about the spare capacity, did you say Saudi sprinkle? Yes. They got a that- little, they sprinkled some fairy dust and gave a little Saudi topper. Uh, it's like when you're, it's like when you go order a drink and you want a little topper on top, that's what you get. That's what they uh, did. Okay. sprinkled an extra million barrels on top of that. And, uh, um, um, <laughs> really, that's what's kind of driving sentiment right now. I think that's why, again, B of A is 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 fairly, cons- uh, it, it, I, I, in my opinion, has it fairly spot on. But we will go ahead and stay up to date with everything that's going on with OPEC. We did see rig counts drop on Friday. Uh, we saw uh, three uh, three count rig increase specifically in the United States. Um, we saw two land, one offshore rig get picked up. Um, and to give you an idea with the, uh, there was four oil and, uh, minus one natural gas rig. So we can, we kind of see that early sentiment of rigs being peeled off right now. 
You know, the only other interesting thing that I saw uh, was a nice little Reuters scoop that came out. Um, Silver Bowl Resources announced on Friday. Well, hey, I'll read you the top headline. Kimridge Energy seeks Silver Bowl board seats. And, uh, you know, on Friday, Kimridge, or excuse me, Silver Bowl went ahead and announced that it's one of its top shareholders or the top shareholder, Kimridge Energy Management, which is a uh, oil and gas private equity com- or, you know, private investment management company, um, well known for their, 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 their control of Civitas is also being the top shareholder um, in, in Civitas, which is that combination of extraction, Crestone Peak, and Bonanza Creek up there. Um, they go ahead and attempt to nominate three candidates to the board following multiple failed attempts in order to take the company private, which I found was very interesting. Silverbow, in this whole announcement, said that Kimridge last February made an all-cash takeover offer to take the company private, which is interesting. All-cash takeover... To be honest, I mean, we'll cover, uh, let me finish this, but I, I found that fact very interesting. Um, the, the proposal actually fell through as Kimbridge was unable to secure total funding for the deal, which means it was fairly debt loaded, which is another interesting note to manage. Um, right. In light of that, Silverbow shares actually popped about 2.6 percentage points. I love how Reuters says in light of that, markets were up 2%. So that's, of course, why oil, you know, civil bro right. was up. So it just, it just happens fact. I don't think this news necessarily meant anything. What this does show is that. Kimber just taking a more active approach and a more activist stance in Silverbow. And Silverbow is pushing back a little bit. Um, basically, that said, you know, they're. The, the, you laughed at this quote when we were reading it earlier, Stu. The company's board says they will review the nominations, said in the regulatory filing, adding that some of the nominations, quote, appear to have close ties with Kimridge. Oh, you don't say. You don't say. Oh, wait. Yeah, you mean they're not? They're related to the company that's nominating them? Hmm, who would have thought that? Um, they also said, I mean, they went deep in this regulatory note. They also said that this was these nominations were part of a, a nearly two-year effort by Kimridge to force a merger with Kimridge Texas Gas on unfavorable terms to the shareholders oh interesting lots Ooh. of tidbits in this silver Bowl said has been engaged with Cambridge several times over a possible deal including last week but has not received any actual proposal they, this article finalizes by saying Cambridge and hedge fund ripsot capital both two of the largest silver Bowl investors have been pushing u.s oil and gas producer revamp its door uh, board and address government's concerns and boost its lagging performance here's what i find super interesting so market caps about 740 million dollars right now um, you know, here's my thing. It, it, take two steps back. Silver Bow, they're a pure play Eagleford producer. Um, yep. they originally started back in 2013. Um, or excuse me, in in, in Q2 of 20, you know, they, they've been around for for about 10 years now. Um, but going back to t- Q1 2021, they were sitting at about 35,000 BOE per day. Have made one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different act eight different kind of merger and acquisitions culminating in their Chesapeake Eagleford acquisition uh, which takes them to about 85 to 94,000 BOE per day we do know that that's about 43% liquid or 43% oil weighted so cut that number in about half and what i find interesting is so they're sitting at about a 75 you know 740 million dollar market cap right now today last february that was probably you know they're down about you know, I, I, I we got to look at their chart here, but but it's going to be more than what it is now. If you just take their current oil production, multiply that by twenty five thousand dollars per barrel. Okay, well, that's an average deal cost for a flowing barrel of oil today. You get about eight hundred and seventy five million dollars. What's hilarious is Silverboat touts on its website they have a thousand undeveloped gross locations. Well, guess what? The market thinks those are worth literally nothing. <laughs> because they're price, literally it's worth nothing or negative. They feel like they're going to to develop those locations. You're going to end up losing. I mean, it's not exactly what the market thinks of it, but it gives you an idea of the inventory that Silverbow has. The market thinks sucks, which I find really interesting. And, and I always yeah. love one of the few facts I like. Now, you can find flowing barrels for a little bit higher, but even if you're paying 35000 per flowing BOE or barrel of oil, holy smokes, you're looking at, you know, there is very little distinction. Right. 
your undeveloped locations and what the market thinks they're worth. I find that hilarious. What, what I also find interesting is I wonder if Kimridge, the reason why they won't make a deal to take over the company right now is they've is they've realized, oh yikes, maybe we don't want to get in bed with an eagle for an eagle for an operator who's only forty three percent oil with where gas prices are right now. They would have massively overpaid last February relative to where Silver Bow's acquisition, and they would have paid all cash. That's the interesting part. They would have overpaid last year and paid all cash for it, which means it was mostly debt. And when they could have, if they make the deal now, they could have theoretically not paid in stock, but they, you know, because they really can't, Kimbridge can't pay in stock per se, but they could have done something and at least gotten a bigger discount, which is right. absolutely hilarious. Or they could have forced a merger with one of their other public companies. I mean, you think about it, they have a, a roster of public companies that they could have gone ahead and merged with. I, I don't quite know who the best fit was, but I find it super interesting. It, it also seems like, you know, in Kimridge's defense, you know, Silverbow does have a consolidated board in which a lot of those board members have very little, very little equity investment in the company. And that's the part of the big reason you see aqua, activist investors in the oil and gas space. I mean, it's it's this is this is something that has plagued the business for a while is you've got a board of directors and a management team who has zero stake in the company. They're just collecting paychecks and you know, spending shareholder money. So somebody like Kimridge is definitely going to want kind of their and they're known for kind of having their 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 control. We've seen what's gone on with Sid Vitas in Colorado. Very interesting that they were also trying. They're also trying to force a merger with their Texas gas subsidiary. Um, our wow. Kimmerich's case. I don't know the full economics behind that. I think you you know that's uh in in interesting, but clearly Silver Road doesn't think it's right for the shareholders. What's hilarious yeah. is Kimmerich is their shareholder. So I always find it interesting when if yeah. Kimmerich, their biggest shareholder, wants it, but Silver Road doesn't think it good. Well, who? What shareholders are you talking about? So we'll, we'll have to dig in more. I found this very interesting, though. This dropped on Friday. My uh, my head hurts a little bit from hearing this analysis, but I can't wait for more of it. But we almost need a uh, miracle pill, chocolate pill from uh, Miracle Max. And uh, this story is not quite dead yet. No, I think there's more to come. I mean, I think Kimmerich is going to be active. In, I mean, right now it's it's. Their thesis, their investment thesis over the last five to ten years has been the M and A space needs consolidation. There needs to be mergers. The only way that that's been their their in overall investment thesis, and so they're loving what's happening right now. And you would expect them to continue to push that way as really the industry has caught up to what their thesis is. Now, right, that, it doesn't mean that they're going to make great decisions on who to merge, you know, but. What it does mean is that their overall thesis was somewhat correct. So it's just a matter of how that kind of plays out in the future. You know, I think for Civitas, it's gone OK. You know, we'll see what happens and we'll be following what's going on with Silverbow. But I always find that find that hilarious. You're uh, the street basically values your locations at nothing. Good luck. Ruh -roh. <laughs> hey, you and a lot of other companies. So it's not just Silverbow. Trust me. Oh, yeah. Every what else are you watching out for this week, Stu? Oh, uh, just kind of buckle up. Should be an entertaining week. Should be a very entertaining week. And with that, guys, we'll go ahead and let you get out of here, get back to work. Uh, appreciate everybody checking us out. World's greatest website, energynewsbeat.com. We'll see you tomorrow.